Welcome to KGOU's How Curious. I'm Rachel Hopkin, and the question I'm seeking to answer in today's episode is, who are the Germans from Russia in Oklahoma? Listener Harriet Waller suggested this subject. She's a member of, and hold on, because this is quite a mouthful, the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia, Central Oklahoma chapter. And when I met her at a recent meeting, I asked her why she wanted How Curious to cover this. You want the real reason? Yes. <laughs> publicity. People just don't know we're here. There are a lot of us and we don't get counted. They might say, what ethnic culture are you? And the people say German. Well, that's different from Germans from Russia. I tell people, we're the other Germans. <laughs> Philip Bryan is president of the Central Oklahoma chapter of the society. Both he and Harriet grew up with German-speaking grandparents and assumed themselves to be simply German. In Harriet's case, an aunt set her straight. I was in high school and she said, we're not from Germany, we're from Russia. Meanwhile, Dr. Phil, as Harriet calls him, he's a retired surgeon, didn't learn about his Russian heritage until he was almost 60, when his mother gave him an old family passport from the country. For my part, I had heard a little bit about the Germans from Russia living in Oklahoma, thanks to another of their descendants, Shirley Lorenz. If you're a regular How Curious listener, you may remember Shirley from our Shattuck Windmill Museum episode. It all started, Shelley had told me, with Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great was the great empress of Russia. That's how she got the name. But she was actually a minor German royal who married Peter when she was very, very young and embraced Russia like it was her home. She did not, however, embrace her husband. And just months after he became czar in 1762, she helped engineer a coup against him, usurping him as Russia's leader in the process and she realized that the land to be farmed in Russia was not being done very well, or at least that's how she saw it. So she started sending out invitations to other people, especially Germans, to come to Russia and start farming. This was a period before Germany as we know it today actually existed. So what we're talking about here are peoples living across a large swathe of central northern Europe and who spoke some kind of German dialect. So back to Catherine, getting the land developed agriculturally wasn't her only objective. Through several Russian-Turkish wars, they had gained all of the land that is now southwest Ukraine. There were marauding tribes that devastated the lands. So she was wanting peoples to become a buffer against those tribes and basically elevate the level of her country. I bet she didn't put that thing about being a buffer in her advertising <laughs> literature. No, she didn't. What she did put in, however, was enticing. She promised freedom from taxes for 10 years, freedom from conscription, which was very important to particularly the Mennonites who were pacifists. They were allowed to have their own language, their own churches, and basically their own civil governments in the villages. The first groups came to the Volga region in 1763-64. Then there were several later waves. Basically, anytime there were turmoils in Europe, people were looking for a way out, and Catherine gave them an exit. Not that it was exactly a bed of roses in Russia. There were a lot of hardships. There were diphtheria, there was cholera, there were locusts, there were droughts, there were famines on and on and on. Some of the areas developed quite well because they were given this autonomy. They kept their traditions, they kept their language, they kept their religion, so they maintained their identity throughout that whole time. And then as Russia started to foment with all their political upheaval. This is Shirley Lorenz again. They started leaving and many of them came into the central United States and a lot of them ended up here. Whenever emigration occurs, there are usually push and or pull factors at play. One of the big things pushing these German groups out of Russia was the fact that many of the privileges that had been granted to them by Catherine, who was now long dead, were being rescinded. The reinstatement of compulsory military service was especially unpopular. My name is George Burt Flaming. And where are we? We are in Corn, Oklahoma. And more specifically? Uh, where God lives. Oh, okay. That's great. I, mm -hmm. I was actually meeting the museum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, we're in the Corn Museum. George Burt Fleming, or Burt, is in his early 80s, and his grandfather was a member of one of the 13 original Germans from Russia families which settled in Corn, Oklahoma. 
Corn is one of a number of Oklahoma towns, also including Shattuck, which were basically founded by Germans from Russia. As before, the Germans from Russia now in the US tended to developing communities centered around a specific church. In Corn, that church was Mennonite. Let's uh, go down here. The Corn Museum isn't that big, but one corner of it is set up like an old post office. My grandfather is the one who uh, was the postmaster in April the 4th of 1903. Mm -hmm. So was he born in America? He was born in America, Marion County, Kansas, 1876. That's where the Fleming family had initially settled when they first moved to America three years earlier, along with the entire Mennonite Brethren Church from their village. One of the main pull factors drawing them and other Germans from Russia to the U.S. at that time had to do with the railroads. The railroad companies had been given the land either side of their tracks and they wanted to populate them with people who could create products that could then be shipped using their trains. Who better than these Germans in Russia who'd become renowned as highly skilled farmers? Back in Russia, they'd successfully cultivated a robust hard wheat known as Turkey Red. And when they relocated to the U.S., they brought grains of it with them and started raising it here, thus helping the central part of the U.S. where they settled gain its nickname of the breadbasket of America. By the way, amidst those wheat grains lurk some seeds of the Russian thistle, better known here as tumbleweed. In any case, it wasn't long before the Flamings and their Mennonite neighbors farming in Kansas ran into a problem. These Mennonites uh, had a lot of children. Bert's grandfather, for example, was one of 17 siblings. After one generation, there was no place for him to farm. And so they started looking for other places to go. A man by the name of John Cleaver had established a Mennonite mission close to where corn is now during the 1880s. After the 1892 Oklahoma Territory land run, some of the land in this area remained unclaimed, and Cleaver encouraged his Kansas colleagues to check it out. After doing so, the Flamings, along with 12 other Mennonite families, moved here in 1893. A year later, the community had built itself a church, and within a decade, they'd also established the first Christian school west of the Mississippi, the Corn Bible Academy. It still exists today, although it's in a different location. Back then, it was housed in a prominent building just across the road from Bert's grandfather's general store, which he'd started in 1898, and which became home to the Corn Post Office five years later. Do you know how it came by the name of corn? It seems like they grew more wheat than corn. <laughs> it originally started off as being named Corn Valley, and then they found out there was already a post office named Corn Valley, so they said, well, okay, we'll just drop the valley. And, and it was called corn with a K, first of all, yes. wasn't it? When mm -hmm. did it change to a C? 1918, during the World <gasps> War I, there was a lot of persecution in this area. My great-grandpa's brother was lynched. Gretchen Reimer is descended from another of those 13 original corn families, many of whom had continued to use German dialect as their primary language after they moved here. As anti-German sentiment grew, this made them a target, especially the men, like Gretchen's great-uncle. They had strung him up, and he had to kiss all the stars on the flag, which he did. Then they kicked the whatever out, and so he was swinging. But the law cut him down. And he lived in Collinsville at the time. Because of that happening, that created a lot of fear, too, and the things that were going on here. They went to Canada for a short time, and then they came back. Of course, there was also no exemption from military service here. But during the First World War, many Mennonites were allotted non-fighting but still vital roles, as firemen, for example. During the Second World War, however, things had changed, causing friction in the corn community. Some people... They got drafted and they decided they would just go ahead and be in the military. When they came back from the military, the church wanted them to apologize or ask for forgiveness, and they refused to do that. So they formed their own church just across the street. But here's something you might be interested in. Bert was leading me towards a photo of one of those corn men who joined the military. You ever heard of Dutchendorf? No, so it's, we're looking uh, have at Have you ever heard of John Denver? I've heard of John Denver, well, yes. Well, Hank Dutchendorf is John Denver's father. Oh! Well, they said, you've got to have a different name than Dutchendorf. But anyhow, I knew Hank very well, and he grew up just across the road from me, on the farm. He's in the, in the Air Force Hall of Fame. 
Hank Dutchendorf had already moved away by the time he became a father, and the family never returned here to live. But they often visited, and sometimes their son would work here during the summers. One season he worked for my Uncle John and Aunt Selma Martin. This is Gretchen Reimer again. And I remember being at summer union, and Uncle John's grandkids were telling me a story when John Denver worked for them. He uh, would always play his guitar in the evenings, and he'd always say, he's going to be big, he's going to be famous, you know, he's going to make it. And they always felt so bad because they didn't have the heart to tell him that he did not have a very good voice. (laughs) I have a very similar story. I had an aunt and uncle from California. They would always visit the Dutchendorfs before they came to visit us. And so they came to Oklahoma City to visit us, and we were discussing what was going on, you know. And he said, oh, did you know John Denver cut a record? I said, no. And he said, well, Hank gave me a sample of it. Well, I said, let's put it on the record player, and I listened to it, and I said, he's not going anywhere. Bert told me that at the last census, Corn's population numbered at just over 600. Of that, what percentage would you say had a similar background to you? Probably 40%. Even so, Bert says he still sees a strong Germans from Russia Mennonite influence in the area, including in business dealings. A handshake is a contract. And of course, the church services and all. I mean, we have certain foods that we brought over from Russia. And if you eat here today, you can eat Veronica. Veronica is a cottage cheese stuffed dumpling is what it is. It smells delicious. Just a few doors along from the Corn Museum is the Corn Cafe. And on the third Friday of each month, it offers Germans from Russia food specials. After I'd finished my visit to the museum, I went over there with Gretchen, her sister Chris, and Korn's mayor, Barbara Nuremberg. Bert had headed home by that stage, but as he said, Veronica was on the menu. Which is better, boiled or fried? I like boiled. I like fried. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> and Veronica is more German-Russian, not really German-German. I ended up getting one boiled Veronica and one fried. And because ethical journalists should never show bias, I won't tell you which I preferred, but I will say I pretty much licked my plate clean. Meanwhile, I learnt still more about corn. Yeah, corn has a few things that it's famous for, like John Denver, tornado video. Apparently, the first US video of a tornado was shot in corn in 1951. Well, well, we're the only town in the United States named corn. corn. Is that true? Yes, yeah, it's the only corn. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you too would like to visit corn, Oklahoma, you hopefully won't get it confused with anywhere else. Thank you very much to Harriet Wyler for suggesting today's topic and to all of the other contributors to this episode. There's a link to the Central Oklahoma chapter of the Germans from Russia Society on our webpage. Search for KGOU and How Curious. How Curious is a KGOU public radio production. I'm Rachel Hopkin. The editor is Logan Layden and David Gray composed our theme music. We love receiving listeners' ideas, so if you have one, please send it to curious at kgou.com. This is my voice. It can tell you a lot about me, and I'm not changing it for anyone. In NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, you'll find a collection of NPR episodes centered on the Black experience. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get podcasts.